Welcome everyone to today's Atlantic Circle in conversation session. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Jen Bond, uh, class of 2004, who will talk to us about her social entrepreneurship journey. But before we begin, I would like to say a few uh, housekeeping uh, points. Uh, my name is Magda Joshi. I'm a member of the Philanthropy Partnerships and Engagement team and I'm the Events and Alumni Engagement Manager. Um, I would like to request if you could uh, rename yourselves to reflect your affiliation to the college and your uh, year of uh, graduation uh, so that we know who you are in case you'd like to ask uh, questions later on. We will be uh, taking questions throughout the event via the chat function, which uh, should be available at the bottom of your uh, screen or on the right, where you can type in your comments and questions. We'll return to them um, directly after Jen's uh, presentation. Um, also, please kindly stay on mute throughout uh, the presentation um, unless you, later on you'd like to ask a question. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it is now my pleasure to hand over to Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Magda, and thanks everyone for coming on. I'm going to try and share my screen um, and hopefully this will work uh, first time, see if it works. Have we all got my screen? Amazing, I can see Magda smiling. Thank you so much for coming along um, today. And I'm really um, honoured to be asked to, to speak um, at the um, Atlantic Circle in Conversation series and hopefully share some of my experience as a social entrepreneur and the journey that I've been on over the last, um, over the last eight years. Um, so, to start off with and, and set the scene a little bit, um, my family, of which there are some on the call, may disagree with me here, but I, um, I put this picture up as I believe that it's the first and probably last time in my life that I've sat down and refused to get up and move forward. Um, it's also a very personal picture. It's obviously from my childhood and I want to start as I mean to go on. Um, in this afternoon's talk. This is a personal journey, as is reflected in the title, a journey that's still going on, um, and one that I hope will be of use and, and hopefully of interest to you all in different ways. I grew up on the edge of Braunston in Leicester and went to my local secondary school, um, which at the time was um, had quite a low pass rate. It was in a very challenging area, about 28% 5 to Cs. I was surrounded um, by people who were really different to me and um, who had much more challenging home lives than I experienced growing up. And I worked really hard to try and bring people together, including setting up the school's first peer mediation service, which made me really popular. Um, when in 2002, I left Leicester to go to Atlantic College, um, my ability to connect with people who were different from me um, meant that I could really contribute to bringing people together from different backgrounds. I felt that I very felt very comfortable in that setting. That said, I also realised how little I knew about the wider world um, and even the community that I grew up in, and that the only way to really learn was to get confident with not knowing <laughs> and to speak up and ask questions. And I believe that the sort of entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit that um, that I have now, I believe I have now, was really ignited by the challenge and the opportunity that I embraced in those teenage years at, uh, in Leicester and then, and then at Atlantic College. After college, I traveled, I went to university to study international relations and social psychology. No idea what I wanted to do with it. Um, I just like people in the world. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I spent my second year um, of university on an Erasmus program in Bordeaux and then went to work in London. Um, I worked for a large blue chip uh, company in London and it really, that time there, which was only six months actually before I was made redundant um, in the 20, uh, 2008 um, recession, um, it really made me realize that there was a huge disconnect between business, um, big business and communities. And, um, and that's when I sort of moved into the third sector the voluntary sector, however you refer to the sector, um, the, the, yeah, that sector. So um, 
whilst I whilst I moved into the third sector, I used the money from my redundancy to study a master's in business and community at the University of Bath. And, and I used that time whilst I didn't feel that the degree was as hands on as I wanted it to be. I really wanted to get stuck in at that stage. I networked a lot and met some really interesting people. Um, and it's actually when I came across an organization that ran a grant funded program called Solutions for the Planet. Um, the, the board of that organization uh, were in the process of shutting the business down because it had run out of grant funding. And one of my good friends, Kat, Luck, Kat Luckock, and I decided that we wanted to actually approach that board um, at the age of 26, I think we were, 25, 26, and pitch to them um, to take on Solutions for the Planet and launch it as a social enterprise. That was in 2012. And eight years on, um, we have got a flagship program, which is called the Big Ideas Program. It's award winning. It's a sustainability focused enterprise program delivered in secondary schools, high schools across England and Scotland. We match businesses um, with schools, employee mentors with teams of young people. Um, the program encourages critical thinking, problem solving. It's all about creativity and finding space for that in the curriculum. We engage young people with STEM, so that's science, technology, engineering and maths and also the enterprise skills that they need um, and that I found very useful in life and after school. Um, so it's also about challenging them to think about the sustainability issues that matter to them, um, not to sort of say these are the ones that are important you need to care about, but what do you care about? And then work in teams to solve some of those issues. By the end of this academic year, we'll have worked with 23,000 young people across the UK and over 500 business mentors. So, they're numbers that I'm super proud of um, from that first year where we were working um, just up in Yorkshire in six schools. We're now working from Central Belt Scotland down to Portsmouth in I think it's 15 cities across the across the UK. This year has been a bit of a different journey for Solutions for the Planet. Um, I went on holiday uh, with my mum back in March and when I got back it was uh, I knew that I had a strong feeling that the business I'd be leading over the next few months was going to be very different to the one that I'd left. Um, there was talk of schools closing, distancing measures were being put in place, travel restrictions which are all kind of key when you're running a program in schools across the UK. And like many people managing a business, um, whether it's a social enterprise or um, a, a, another type of business, I was faced with the, the possibility that we wouldn't be able to continue um, running the programme and doing our work in 2020. Um, it was looking pretty bleak at the time. However, um, there was one problem <laughs> I guess and that's by the 18th of March which was the same week that the schools were closing we'd received 153 submissions from teams spanning across the UK big ideas that the students have been working on for six months and they had hope passion determination excitement they'd showed so much resilience and positive action that we knew as an organization that we had to find a way to carry on and get these ideas out into the world. What this actually meant for the business and the impact that it would have on everyone involved was at the time unknown. And what I'm going to share with you this afternoon are the three key ingredients that after lots of reflection um, have made it from my perspective a successful pivot. Oh, it zooms out. I forgot I had a bit of animation on that. Look, that's how many there are. I can move it on. So these three key ingredients are a purpose driven, sustainable business model. A social enterprise, I, I've kind of come in with the assumption that people are aware what a social enterprise is, and I maybe shouldn't have come in with that assumption. Um, but a so social enterprise is fundamentally a business. Um, it's got environmental and social aims in its articles of association. It's got an asset lock um, in the business. Um, and 
the third one has skipped my mind um because i wasn't going to explain that so uh, i'll come back to you on that one um but we're a business oh i remember over 50 percent of your income has to come from trading so it has to come from sales rather than grants so the three key ingredients a purpose-driven sustainable business model a strong circle of influence so that's the people that surround you and due care and attention to your health and well-being um so that's what i'm going to run through with you this afternoon so this is kat lacock my friend uh who we um start who started the business uh with me and when we set up we knew um, because of the fact that the programme had been grant funded and then um, was ceasing to exist because it had run out of grant funding, we knew that we didn't want to be reliant on grant funding. We didn't really want to be a charity, even though we had huge social aims. Um, we wanted to be a business, we wanted to be a social enterprise, making profit that we could reinvest in our social and environmental aims. That was really, really important to us. Um, securing our sales um, over securing sales sorry over grant income which would make us truly sustainable sustainable um i was going to say sustainable by name sustainable by nature but we're not sustainable by name it's solutions for the planet um so we had to come up with a way of pitching the features of the business as advantages and ultimately benefits that corporates who were our customers would pay for um, starting and following with uh, following, sorry, Simon Sinek's uh, footsteps, we started with our why. Um, so our why has evolved uh, over time, but I'd say there are six uh, key areas of our why at Solutions for the Planet. We're about empowering the voice of young people, specifically in in key in key global issues that affect us all. Um, connecting schools and businesses, young people and employees, um, which ties in with careers, opportunities and careers education. Um, in the UK, we've got Gatsby benchmarks, um, which are an indicator for that. Um, increasing sustainability awareness and action. Um, creating, greater of, creating greater opportunity for creativity within the curriculum, a curriculum that is very, um, information rich in the UK, in England and Scotland have different curriculums actually, but in England um, and Scotland there's a lot of information we need to teach our young people um, and creativity can sometimes um, come sec play second fiddle to that. Um, also developing key skills in young people, particularly STEM skills, so science, technology, engineering and maths, entrepreneurial skills, employability skills, um, very much life skills, critical thinking, problem solving, um, teamwork. And the last why was looking at widening and diversifying the talent pools. I say talent pipelines, that's quite corporate language, um, but it's also about increasing opportunity and expanding young people's horizons to look at opportunities that they may not have previously considered. Once we were clear on our why, we set about figuring out how this could be the why for the businesses that we worked with. Um, the framework that I'm now going to share has evolved a lot over the last eight years, um, but it is the framework that I currently use to sell the Big Ideas programme into businesses. And there are three key areas of that. The first one is around communications. So we looked at um, what the Big Ideas programme could provide for businesses and what would be um, perceived by them as something that they would pay for that would be of value to them. Communications covers things like um, the good news stories that come out of the mentors work with the schools, increasing online engagement, um, increased social media interaction with really positive news stories, um, and also the, the affiliation with some of the awards and positive um, yeah, and positive accolades that the program has got. Um, so communications was a big theme. That ties in also to the second area, which is around social value and sustainability. This is probably um, one of the most traditional areas um, that I, I would say um, organisations go into in uh, 
that voluntary or third sector organizations approach businesses for things like sponsorship because it's a, a good thing to do we're doing something really positive for the community um but this is actually of real value to the businesses um things like community engagement um building positive relationships in local communities where they're operating where they have um where they have major operations whether that's a site or they have a lot of traffic passing a school so building those relationships and also sustainability, understanding the challenges that their business have around sustainability and sharing those challenges with young people and hearing their ideas um, for how to move things forward in a positive way. And that ties in to the fact that social value is increasingly being requested in tenders for work. So some of our businesses can actually say, right, we've worked on this um, Solutions for Planet's Big Ideas program, um, and we've got a tried and tested model that we could move into this particular tender, which we're going for. So that's that's of real value to our businesses. So they tell us. And the third area, which I think is arguably the biggest one, is around people and human resources or HR. So that means both their existing workforce engaging their employees upskilling their employees with mentoring skills, coaching skills, presentation skills, um, creativity and innovation. Um, I once had a conversation with a business who said, the ideas coming out of these, um, these young people are better than the, um, the ideas coming out of our graduates. How can we make our graduates more innovative? And I just said, put them as mentors on the Big Ideas programme. If you're in a room with young people, you see that spark, you see that energy and um, and businesses pay loads of money for innovation training around, around that area. So that's a big, a, a key area. But it's not just about existing workforce, it's also about the future talent. So looking at young people, where there are skills gaps. In the UK, we've had a STEM skill shortage for um, a number of years. So that's, again, science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, we have issues around diversity in different workforces and Solutions for the Planet um, has over the last few years particularly worked in con with construction, manufacturing, energy companies, big engineering companies where there is a real lack of um, women, um, there's a real lack of people from different um, backgrounds, uh, BAME backgrounds um, and they're really keen to be um, really inclusive um, in the way that they are both advertising work and also attracting a variety of talent. Um, so they're some of the areas, they're the sort of the key areas and the over, overview of how we pitch into businesses. Through this model, um, and I only worked this out yesterday, which has made me really excited, so you're the first people to hear this, um, but through this model, we have brought in £950,000 in the last eight years, so just shy of £1 million. It's eight years, so it's quite a long time, but that's a figure that I'm really proud of in terms of our trade and income. So that's all I'm going to share for now on the purpose-driven sustainable business model. The next area that I'm going to talk um, about and share with you is circle of influence, the people around me as an entrepreneur. Um, your circle of influence, I think, is absolutely critical to um, personal and professional success. Um, and there are a number of different areas to that, uh, strings to that bow, as it were. The first one that I want to talk about is the importance of mentors to me. So um, I talked, to, I mentioned at the beginning that at Atlantic College, I learned how to ask questions and to not, not be a shy, not knowing things, thinking I knew things that I'd seen on the news, which actually when you talk to someone who uh, is living through it is completely not the case. So I'm never shy of asking for help. Um, and on the screen now, you can see Kevin Schofield. Kevin was the chair of the Solutions for the Planet board, um, and he was hugely pivotal in my um, development as a young entrepreneur um, at the age of 26. Um, he was very, uh, he shared a lot of his knowledge, a lot of his skills, and he showed belief in me that I didn't have in myself, certainly, at that age. Um, 
how this also becomes personal is that in 2016, um, I received a phone call on New Year's Eve, which from Kevin, in which he told me that he had um, terminal cancer and within 50 days he had died. Um, and so that for, a, for anyone <laughs> is a lot to deal with. Um, and it was quite a, a big time in the business. A lot of change was going on. Um, and I learned a huge amount like from Kevin. And when he died, I thought, felt, uh, had a great sense of loss. But on reflection, I realized that the, everything that I'd learned from him as a mentor, I actually had the, I had I actually passed on to everyone around me. So the fact that Kevin had um, taught me a load of lessons that I then went on to share with other people meant that the energy that he gave to me was being passed on to others. And even though he was no longer physically there, his energy was completely living on and it actually really changed the way that I look at life and the way that I give out my energy to other people. Because even if it's for a really short amount of time that you're exposed to someone, that they give you this amazing vibe, amazing energy, amazing belief in yourself, that can really transform the way that you then interact with other people. So key lessons that I learned from Kevin, be careful and selective about the relationships you put your energy into. He had this big thing about drains and radiators, which I did not like initially. because I was like, you can't put people into two camps, drains and radiators. But the principle of it was that their world is full of two types of people, drains, people who like suck out your energy, leave you feeling really flat. They don't give you anything back. And radiators, people who just give out loads of heat, warmth, make you feel positive, believe in yourself. And actually, it's OK to be a drain sometimes, but you need to make sure you surround yourself with enough people that radiate positive energy and radiate good um you know things that things that make you a better person um it's okay not to have all the answers um and that's I sort of started learning from a young age but it definitely reinforced that for me be bold and brave and believe in yourself when you find good people look after them um I think it can be all too easy um to to find a good person and then get busy doing something else and not nurture those relationships so that is absolutely something that I learned from Kevin and also that time scheduled into the diary for health and social reasons is as if not more important than anything business related um, and that was a big one for me because I'm the first person to not go to the gym if I get a if I get a good business you know a, a good business lead but actually that's really really important um, Kevin was not and uh, is not my only mentor. Um, getting confident asking for help means that I do ask for help a lot. There are people on this call who I've asked for a lot of help from. And if you've, you're open to asking and receiving help, that help, then I've found that people are more than willing to share it. So that's definitely something about having a circle of influence, asking for help and giving help when it's asked for as well. Oh, so quick picture. This is the friends and family. I think that in terms of your circle of influence, I'm hugely lucky to have such a supportive family, which um, I, I don't imagine that Solutions to the Planet would be where it was if I hadn't had that support. And also um, the friends that I've got uh, from college and beyond. For me, they're the foundations, people who are by your side through thick and thin, who love you unconditionally, help you believe in yourself and encourage you to be the best you can be. Now, the other people that are key in my circle of influence are the team that I work with. Um, and recruiting the right people, which I have done and also done very successfully and sometimes not so successfully, um, is, really, uh, is really, really important. I think with recruitment, like anything else, it's best to fail fast, fail quick, fail cheaply. Um, so uh, if something's not working out, then it's good to nip it in the bud. But the team that we have now got at Solutions to the Planet, um, the team is in the top of the picture. And uh, in the bottom, you can see the wider board and to the right is the last time we were all together. Um, the team now have shared values. We know the importance of communication. We're already a remote team before COVID. Um, so based from 
uh, Bradford, Birmingham, London, uh, Bristol. So we know the importance of communication and also supporting each other personally as well as professionally. Um, and having the strength of character and the strength within the relationships of the team to be critical friends to one another. And finally, um, who do you sell to and who benefits from your programme? Um, it's so important to be selective about the people that you choose to work with. But on the screen now, you can see a picture that was taken a few weeks ago at our national final event. Um, you can see our business partners on there. You can see our team. You can see some of the students um, and everyone is in it together. Um, and that is something that is has been completely invaluable when it turns to um, all being in this together. I've got the that song from uh, High School Musical and it's we're all in this together. Um, it's been absolutely um, invaluable to make the program a success this year no one knew what was going to happen but everyone um, was committed to trying to make it work um, and so that is another key uh, segment of of my circle of influence and next up finding people in similar situations is so important as an entrepreneur it can be a lonely place even having such a fantastic team, when it comes down to it, you're the person who is um, is responsible. So, um, so that can be lonely and finding connection, understanding and friendship. Um, other than Kat, I knew one other person my own age um, when, when we started on this entrepreneuring journey, Ben, who's on the call. Um, and that is like that's terrifying so I joined a number of accelerator programs through School for Social Entrepreneurs Unlimited and then latterly the NatWest um, Entrepreneur Accelerator and that gave me a network of people who were all in the same boat um, things that my family or friends um, or my team maybe couldn't quite understand those people um, those people just knew I didn't have to explain explain myself um, and some of those relationships have been have lasted well beyond the program uh, in a, an incredibly supportive way. OK, I'm going to speed on. Um, this is just a quick slide because I found the other day my application, uh, my personal statement from my application to Atlantic College. And I read it and I thought, wow, some things don't change. Um, so I wanted to share it, um, which is. And I'm just going to read the first bit of it. I think my four best qualities, I wrote this when I was um, 15, are my ability to listen. My friends often talk to me when they have problems. My friendliness, the fact that I'm always bubbly and I love being with people. This is probably my biggest passion. I'm also very confident. I have been involved in presentations to over 200 people. And finally, I would say I'm a good leader. I'll take the lead in nearly any situation. And I encourage people to put their ideas forward and motivate each other. I think something very important about my character is that I always try to look on the bright side of things. I don't know exactly what I want to do. However, I definitely want to work with people. Um, and I was stubborn as a child. I, you know, when I set my mind on something, I held on tightly. I held on for dear life until I could make that happen. Um, I'm not gonna read, uh, in terms of time, I'm not gonna read this, uh, the next section. But this is what is now written on my LinkedIn profile. So connect with me um, and you can see it. But what I want to say is um, I'm not sure that a rope is the best analogy here, but a best, best metaphor. Um, but I do feel that understanding what I see as my strengths um, as a child and, and continue to, and then, and then latterly more accepting my weaknesses, I've grown from holding on for dear life to actually finding more of a balance. Um, and I was really proud of myself for walking on that slack line as well. So 10 years, um, I wanted to share a bit about AC. Um, just a really quick slide. Um, while thing, some things clearly stay the same, stubbornness being one of them, um, but an ability to find balance, other things shift and change dramatically, perception being one of those. And if there are any current students on, I think this is this is quite important. I, I remember vividly thinking as I left Atlantic College about our 10 year reunion. And I wondered whether the one question I had in my mind was whether I'd bring my husband and 2.4 children with me 
or whether I would go it solo and rekindle the old days and have a big blowout. That was the first thing I thought about. 10 years later, I was four heartbreaks down and no closest to that husband and 2.4 children, but I had found something that I didn't dream of having at the age of 26, a business that aligned perfectly with my personal values, that fed my current sense of personal purpose in life. Um, I didn't have 2.4 children, I had 4,000 annually. Um, and my 10 year, re year reunion was amazing. I had to put some pictures of an AC on there. So it was a fantastic experience. And anyone who was with me at that event and we had our the 20 year reunion people there too will know that it was, I, I was literally filled with pure joy and my perspective had completely shifted from what I thought was, you know, the things that would define success for me in life. Um, that said, when I found my professional purpose in life and that, and that aligned so closely with my sense of personal, personal purpose, I found it all too easy to lose my personal direction and get distracted from looking after my health and well-being. At 24, I was diagnosed with endometriosis, a chronic gynecological disease that can be both severely painful and affect fertility. I realise I can't say entrepreneurial very well or gynaecological, so <laughs> um, that's, I'm going to have to work on those two. Anyway, this was a moment of reset for me. At a young age, I perceived my body to be broken. Um, in actual fact, one in 10 women have endometriosis. Around 1.5 million women in the UK are currently living with the condition. The endometriosis diagnosis, however, did have a big impact on me. It forced me to confront the fact, as an eternal optimist, which I am, that sometimes bad things do happen um, and you don't have control over them. But I was in the privileged position, and I do regard this as a privilege to have a choice, either to succumb to the pain and distress of the situation or to find a way of building a relationship with the situation that allowed me to grow in myself instead of feeling like my endometriosis was a disability, I came to view it as somewhat of a superpower. Um, something that some of the women in the support group that I ran in Bristol found really difficult to grasp actually. Endometriosis, endometriosis is affected by hormones and so is stress. Um, and when I got stressed, my endo would flare up. So stress actually caused me physical pain. Um, running a business can be perceived as very stressful. Um, and I think many people, particularly women, drive through stress, accept stress as a part of life um, and men for that matter. But for me, that meant accepting that pain was a part of life. And I just wasn't up for that at the time. So I found ways of managing stress, more ways than um, I can go into now, mostly successfully, although I'm sure anyone who knows me knows that there are times I still um, identify with that. Um, but one of the big ones was a disassociation with the word stress. Um, there are another few words that I tried disassociating with, um, things like busy and fine or not too bad. And actually the power of changing your language around these things um, is huge. Uh, so instead of saying I'm stressed, I'd actually articulate what the situation was. Um, and so that was an opportunity to sort of dissipate the stress perceived stress and therefore literally dissipate the pain. That said, <laughs> when you're doing something that you love and putting your heart, soul, energy, mind, everything into it, um, and you don't, and you don't identify with stress or being busy, it's easy to lose sight of the toll that this takes on your body and overall well-being. Um, on top of that, from an endometriosis perspective, I ended up having the Mirena coil um, which artificially stopped my periods and therefore stopped my pain. But this also crippled my biological superpower, which led me to understand when I was getting stressed and overdoing it. And this led to my unraveling. I want to share with you what happened to me when I lost myself to my passion for my purpose. Um, in May 2018, I had a big month. It was the regional finals of Solutions for the Planet's Big Ideas programme, seven events in seven cities from Glasgow to Portsmouth. I was traveling around. I think it was a royal wedding at the time. I love a good wedding. I was invited to a European climate conference in Switzerland, a sports event in Barcelona. And on the last weekend of May, 
I was to be bridesmaid at one of my best friend's weddings. Oh, and in the middle of all that, as you can see on the screen, Solutions for the Planet and the Big Ideas Programme won an award for Best Education Project at the Global Good Awards. And there was a big event in London, which I had to fit into my schedule. It was amazing. Um, it was super exciting. However, on the morning of said wedding, I woke up feeling rough, to say the least. I got dressed and got ready to go, as I do. I didn't make it far, feeling very poorly with a nasty blotchy skin. My friend insisted that I go to hospital to get checked out. They told me that I had suspected measles, gave me paracetamol and sent me home. I returned to the wedding, socially distanced from everyone as we're much more used to now than we were then, um, sat at the back and then went straight back to bed at the venue. To cut a long story short, my parents drove down from Leicester, picked me up, um, couldn't drive, um, they took my car and my brother, who was my date to the wedding, uh, home. At 4am the following morning, uh, we got a call back from 111 uh, and they told me I should go to hospital. Um, on admission, my liver and kidneys were severely compromised. I was tachycardic, so that was my heart compromised. And that night I was diagnosed with double pneumonia. It was bad. What you see before you is burnout. Um, there's no doubt, I don't know what the blue line on the screen is, but that was not, that's, I didn't have a blue tube coming out of my nose. Um, I'd literally worked myself and played myself into the ground. My immune system was severely compromised and I was in hospital for 10 days in bed for a further two months. A third of my hair fell out and from the shock to my system and my liver took over six months to recover and this brings me back round to the circle of influence and the importance of having a sustainable business model, a model that could survive without me for the best part of four months, if not longer. And I and the Solutions for the Planet uh, organisation would not have gotten through both my illness and the recovery if it wasn't for the fantastic people, um, both professionally and personally in my circle of influence. I'm close to wrapping up now, but I, I kind of feel the need to hesitate a little bit on this slide because as a social entrepreneur, when you are driven by passion and purpose, burnout is just so um, easy to, uh, it's, it's such an easy thing to, to creep up on you. Um, and I know people that have, have, have burnt out and then come back from that and then burnt out again and come back from that. And like, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. <laughs> I really wouldn't. And so like, it's so important to take care of your health and well-being and listen to people when they say you're burning the candle at both ends or doing too much. Um, it's something that I still struggle with, but I'm much more conscious of it after having experienced what I experienced. Before I wrap up, I want to share a few other things that have personally got me through the last year. Um, nature, walks in woods, Growing my vegetables have been so key, getting out in nature. My shed, where I currently am sitting, um, it's a separate workspace. I adapted it um, at the beginning of lockdown. I'm very lucky to have a shed. It's now insulated, so I'm not freezing. Um, but I think separating work from home where, where possible, even if it's just having a specific corner and that's the corner that you work in, is, um, is just really, really important. It's had many celebration events. That was the, an events night that we had um, where I dressed up and had a party in the shed. Um, taking every opportunity to celebrate the positives. This was an awards night that the team and I attended for a big award we were shortlisted for this year. Um, and it's so important to celebrate the positives at challenging times. PE with Joe with one of my team in lockdown number. Um, it was so, so important actually doing exercise. And as a team, um, we wanted to support each other. And so we did PE with Joe through the first lockdown every day. And Pints for the Planet are weekly and now monthly social as a team. Um, it's really important that it doesn't just become work. <laughs> Um, this is a really cool function on Teams that can make you look like you're sitting in a cinema, which we only discovered about a week ago. Um, but it's so important to, to spend that time together, look after each other, have that reflection time um, and 
I think it's really important to do that with your team where possible, um, as well as your people outside of your network, outside of your outside of your organisation. I'm really grateful to all of you for being here today and having the opportunity to share my journey, bits of my journey, particularly some very personal bits of my journey with you. And I hope that um, that there's snippets that you will be able to take away that are helpful. Um, I had a short video, but I'm not going to show it. I'll, um, I'll, I'll share it afterwards with Magda because I'm just really conscious of time um, and I've gone on a bit. Um, so I won't share the video, um, but I would just like to finish by saying being an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur gives me the opportunity to bring together, bring people together, which I always wanted to do to be flexible, live my life with purpose and according to my own values, take responsibility for myself and others, be curious and learn new things every day, take risks, fall down, fall down a lot and get up a lot over and over and over again, in fact. Um, we're, all, we're always looking as an organisation, um, Solutions to Planet, the Big Ideas programme, um, we've achieved great things up until this point, but we're always looking to expand our networks, meet new people, meet new businesses, schools, um, connect with different organisations. Um, so I'd love after today, if anyone sort of any any interest has been sparked, um, then please do connect with me um, after today. And uh, it would be great to um, great to now have an opportunity to answer any questions or discuss anything with everyone on the call. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, a final. I don't, think, I don't think I can share my video because I didn't share uh, my sound. So I've got a nice little snippet of video, but I didn't share my sound. So I'll just wrap up there. Thanks, Magda. Thank you so much, Jen, for this uh, presentation and also for such a candid and personal journey through your life and work. Uh, it mustn't have been easy. And we, we are all very grateful for your yes, thorough and such impact so impactful um presentation uh if if you if anyone has any questions do uh let us know in the meantime i would like to start with something that's i know is very recent news to you jen and it's a wonderful um you know uh, award and recognition of your work uh, just a few months ago you were awarded the title of woman of inspiration by uh, the women in social Enter, um, enterprise 100 so congratulations on uh, congratulations on Thank that you. and uh, what I was going to ask you about is uh, you talked about the circles of influence in your presentation and I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on uh, influencing specifically women or girls through your work you did mention this briefly as part of your presentation but I just wanted to find out a bit more um, how um, you know this uh, award cemented what you'd already been doing or potentially gave you even more ideas and inspiration for this war mm. thank you yeah I, I think that's a, a really uh, really good question um it's it was a it's a fantastic honor to be recognized as a woman in inspiration in social enterprise um i think uh like in terms of the big ideas program one of the reasons why we target uh, target girls particularly is looking at um, the fact that they are not they, they tend to be uh, industries or areas that they're less inclined to go towards um, and high school is such an influential point for uh, well for all young people um, but it's such an inf influential point in determining um, you know what you're going to go on to do um, and so I guess uh, with the Big Ideas programme, we create a space where girls and um, young women feel confident in their own ideas. Um, and interestingly, with the programme itself, we tend to find that um, because it's a sort of year long programme, um, I don't know if it's because it's a year long programme, we actually get a lot more retention from girls in the programme once they've got an idea. Um, we tend to find our final events have a lot more girls in it than, than we have boys in it. And, and I wonder, I, I, we've not done any research on that actually, but I wonder what are the sort of, what is it about the programme that inspires um, 
girls in particular to feel confident to raise their voices and I wonder if it's some of that self-doubt that they um that that I certainly had um as a as a young girl and sort of not knowing where my voice would be listened to and actually feeling the confidence that someone would listen to it um so from that perspective um like that's that's the program but from from a perspective as a female CEO um people do ask me quite a lot about you know a woman going into corporate businesses how do you feel in that scenario and and the reality is like I have got such strong I've got such strong foundations as a as a person whether that's because I'm a woman or not like I think from my upbringing from my experience from the opportunity that I've been afforded um and the confidence that I have that that I think um, I don't really consider it as a as a barrier, which which I think some people do think of it as. And I think just the attitude that I have towards being a female um, CEO um, of an organisation does act as sort of a quite a, as a role modelling for the young the young girls that we work with. Um, so yeah, that's maybe a long winded answer to to your question, um, Magda, but hopefully it does answer one. I've noticed that there's another couple in the chat. So um, I did focus on Burnett. Claudia, I've seen you, you asked a question about um, other challenges of being a social entrepreneur. Um, there are, I think there are lots of challenges. One of our challenges um, in the way that we run our social enterprise in terms of selling it to businesses is breaking down the, um, the, I guess the attitude within businesses that when you're engaging with a social enterprise, it's a philanthropic, it's generally a sort of philanthropic um, action <laughs> rather than something that is actually going to deliver bottom line value. So breaking down some of those um, stereotypes, I guess, that are that are, are sort of developed around engagement with the third sector is definitely a challenge. Um, it's a challenge uh, bringing in enough money to keep the business going. Um, it's sometimes a challenge um, and there is sometimes conflict between the type of businesses that we work with and our aims as an organisation and sort of our values as an organisation. Um, I'd say that's also, also very challenging. Um, and for me, this isn't a challenge, but I do think it can be a challenge for social entrepreneurs is the feeling that profit is not a bad thing, right? Because the more profit that we make as an organization, um, the more we can reinvest in the work that we're doing. But actually pricing your products at the right level, when I, I definitely think that's been a sort of significant challenge for, for me, is kind of going, this is what is, that's, this is the value of what we do. Um, and sticking to that um, and also saying no to anything. <laughs> I really struggle saying no to anything. I just like saying yes to everything, um, every opportunity that comes up. Speak, speaking at different events, um, sort of networking with different people, helping other people, like there's kind of a, a, something that's ingrained around, around wanting to help others, I feel, um, that, that is a challenge. It's a fantastic thing, but it's also a challenge. Um, and uh, in terms of the ideas, yeah, absolutely. Um, for one thing, I've not said anything about the students' ideas because I wasn't focusing on the business. I was more focusing on the journey. Um, but um, Claudia asked, could you please share some of the projects the students have come up with? Um, they are so far reaching and I'd really encourage anyone to go on our website and have a look at the big ideas from this year um, because they're totally inspiring. So this year at our final, we had, um, EAP Solar Solutions, which was um, a machine, their big their issue they'd identified was um, problems around coral reefs and coral reefs, reefs being destroyed. And so they wanted to develop a, a machine that um, dispersed calcium carbonate, which, which was then going to, um, in, their, in their business plan, would sort of produce a count counteract the effects of the acidic nature of the water 
and therefore protect the coral reefs. That was a pretty big idea. We had another idea which was um, looking at mini turbines, so creating a package where schools could um, could get a sort of make your own mini turbine and have a lesson plan to make to teach students how to how to put together a turbine, which could then be lots of lots of different student teams could put these together and then they could use them to power their school. We've had Energy Gym, um, at a school that had loads of old um, old gym equipment, which AC had when I was there. It's probably much more high tech now, but we certainly had a. Um, pretty old old equipment at the time and they wanted to basically um, put things like dynamos onto it existing technologies but adapted um, into the school setting to power the school um, last year's winning team was called Renewabus I've just got one more I'll tell you after this one last year's winning team was called Renewabus which was a bus that was powered by five different types of renewable energy um, they wanted to have um, piezoelectric um, platforms basically everywhere. So when you moved, when you sat down, pressure pads would generate electricity. Um, they'd have um, air that was moving air that would generate power for the bus. They'd have solar panels. They'd have in the bottom of the bus, a sort of a tank, which used the movement of water, um, which helps to balance a bus to actually generate electricity. Um, and then this year's winning team is a team called Food for All. Um, and they are a team from Bannockburn High School up in uh, Stirling. And their big idea initially was to create a, a community cafe in their school, which, um, which would educate people around the importance of healthy eating and also educate people about food waste. So using foods that could be, um, that would be otherwise thrown away for past the sell by dates or, you know, whatever reason um, to, uh, to then uh, create food and, uh, and, and, and sell in the cafe. But what they'd actually ended up doing was completely pivoting because they really wanted to make their idea a reality and they wanted to make it a reality now. And because of COVID, they couldn't continue with their big idea um, in the same way. So they completely reworked their whole business plan and they um, put together a plan for uh, fundraising fundamentally to create food parcels for um, people who were um, food suffering from food poverty in Stirling. Um, they raised in two weeks, they raised £800 and yesterday they just put a post on Twitter that they'd just sent out their first 20 food parcels to the local community. So they range from product service campaigns, huge ideas, um, that will take millions of pounds to make happen to like smaller achievable campaigns um, that can take place in their school and can happen immediately. Do the schools give you time during the uh, curriculum or do the students have to uh, do this as an extracurricular activity? So the big ideas um, program lasts over the whole year. The initial big ideas day is a day off timetable and that's in, in curriculum time. Um, we've adapted the program for this academic year so that can actually be delivered by teachers and we send out a box to them, um, which they're all incredibly nervous about, but they're doing a really great job at it. Usually we deliver that. Um, and then after the Big Ideas Day, Ross, it changes. Um, some schools embed it into a particular lesson. They might embed it into um, science or geography um, or integrated studies. Um, and other schools turn it into an extracurricular activity. Um, so that's when they'd uh, do it after school or do it at a lunchtime club. And we have mentors from our businesses going in to support whenever those sessions take place. Um, and then when it gets to sort of the latter stage of the programme, when it turns into a competition, the actual events themselves, so the regional finals, take place at local universities. So that's a day off timetable when they come and pitch to each other and, um, and to a panel of judges. And the national final traditionally is held at the House of Parliament in London um, every every June. Um, so uh, we have great support from cross party MPs for that event and the students get to meet their MPs, which is fab. Um, we had our national final two weeks ago um, 
which was virtual this year. Um, but we still had uh, eight MPs coming and supporting their teams throughout the day. So that was just that was really fantastic. And the students got, had a had a great day. So much as I think they were sorry not to be in London, they they did have the whole day off timetable and they were um, they were doing different activities and presentations uh, throughout the day. You must spend most of your time scheduling things. <laughs> it's a lot. Four thousand students. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, we've got just under a couple of minutes left. Uh, would anyone uh, like to ask any last minute question or has any comments that we can just take them from you directly? I, I would just like to uh, ensure that Jen doesn't burn herself out. She's, uh, she's obviously got lots of energy and uh, the program is going forward successfully, but uh, uh, get, get some more people helping you there. You look after yourself. Very, thank you. very, very well done. Thank you. Thank but you. Looking by, looking by, but at all, all the faces on, on, on screens, it, this is contagious energy, Jen. So, so you've kind of ex expanded your, you know, your, uh, your enthusiasm and your passion to us all. So yeah, thank thank, thanks, Magda. And I'd also just say, I mean, in terms of, I, I don't feel, uh, I don't feel alone at all in this. I'm not, I've got a team of seven people around me doing it. And then, our wider network you know when we went took the program virtual this year we had business mentors who were furloughed who could not volunteer their time through their business anymore but they stepped forward and said they wanted to continue supporting the program so it's very much not just certainly not just me or even the seven of us the network expands to you know hundreds of people um, that have been involved and I and I class the students um, as part of that too but you know we're always looking for more people who want to be involved in different ways so you're all more than welcome to uh, get involved get in touch and uh, and yeah it'd be, it'd be great to hear from you further. Thank you very much uh, for your time and insights and presentation Jen we are all very grateful um, to uh, those of you who joined us today, uh, my colleague Carissa has just posted a link to our post-event feedback form. If you'd like to share your thoughts and comments with us, uh, that would be great. So do feel free to respond. And uh, we hope to see you all at uh, future events of the Atlantic Circle in Conversation series. Our next event is next Thursday at the same time. And we have a number of events planned for 2021. Thank you very much, everyone, and hope to see you soon. <laughs>